Greetings, everybody. Uh, and we're here for the final lecture, uh, looking at the final chapter of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. Um, uh, as soon as this chapter begins, uh, we recognize that this is the contingency plan. Uh, this is plan B. So if things don't go well at the ranch, which obviously they have not uh, with everything that's transpired, uh, the killing of Curly's uh, wife, everybody on uh, the hunt now for Lenny. Uh, this was plan B all along, that if Lenny were to get in trouble, uh, like he commonly does, uh, to have this kind of meetup place. And, and again, it's ironic when you think about the level of, uh, I guess you could say dysfunction and dismay that's led to all these chaotic events. And here we wind up in a very peaceful environment. Yet this environment, like before, uh, is, you know, the snakes are gliding around. Uh, from there, we're talking about other uh, uh, predators, such as the bird, right? Normally, we think of the snake as the predator, but here we're recognizing that the predator is also the prey, uh, and that these are much more complicated relationships that we end up happening, uh, end up ha having, I should say, uh, in our lives. Um, just like in some respects, we can consider Lenny the predator, what he's done to Curly's wife, what he's done uh, to other things in the past, uh, other um, organisms, uh, and now he is being hunted, right? So very similar. Uh, another thing is when we remember Lenny was studying the uh, playing cards and he was, a, you know, kind of a, a astounded to some degree that it was the same no matter how you flipped it. I think this is one way of applying that idea from that is here we're at the very same place that we began, but now things are, di even though it looks the same, things are definitely different. And uh, Lenny, like, a, like, a, like a, an animal of prey, like a bunny, uh, is uh, like a bunny rabbit, uh, it comes out of the brush, right? Um, I see it all the time when I'm running around where I, where I live, uh, little bunnies, uh, little rabbits scurrying around because they're so used to being hunted, right? And they're so on edge and that's a part of the way that they've evolved. Lenny, despite the fact being described like a bear and his huge uh, kind of appearance here, um, he, is the, he is the prey here, right? And hiding out. Notice the big difference here. We talk about even though we're in the same environment and things match up that way, what's different? One thing we notice right off the back is the way that Lenny is drinking from the uh, pool of water. Uh, here he, I'll read, barely touches his lips to the water, right? Whereas before he was the animal uh, drinking huskily from the water. Uh, and I think this might have a lot to do with if I were to give you the idea right now, redemption. Um, maybe there's six chapters in this book if we're thinking biblically, of course, and sometimes my mind goes there. Uh, thematically, six is mark of the beast. It's the imperfection of man. And we're obviously in this book talking about a lot of imperfections that don't seem to um, allow us to return to a Garden of Eden, a perfection or a harmony of, uh, of sorts. So I think it's impossible to get back at this point. Um, but Lenny has changed here, and I think it might be the fact that he knows he's done something wrong here. And I think we talked about that uh, in, the, in the last lecture. Uh, shortly after it says, Lenny embraces his knees and laid his chin down on his knees. It just feels like, for me at least, uh, kind of a religious uh, posture in which he's allowed to kind of reflect on his, uh, on his experiences. He, said, he does mention the catch-up once again here. Um, he's talking to himself. He says, if George don't want me, I can just go find a place, uh, you know, go find a cave up there. But then he interjects in his own kind of, uh, uh, his own monologue here. And he says, and never have no catch-up, uh, but I won't care. And the only other time we heard about that catch-up again was the beginning and there he did kind of uh, uh, have some concerns over the catch-up. Whether or not he really did or he was doing it to gain leverage over George, uh, we, we kind of had that question. But now we're coming full circle. Everything's the same in terms of appearance, but this has changed also. He wanted it, now he says, eh, it won't matter if I don't have that, right? But I think that is an important concern because we're always wondering what what constitutes as enough for Lenny? Is it just that little bit of a dream and he's happy, like just to be able to tend that those rabbits and be have that that kind of 
partial function in it, or does he need things that are kind of, you know, uh, that represent more, like ketchup, uh, uh, things that would be more uh, of a luxury at that point, excessive, things you could, you really don't need and that you can live without. Uh, when we start thinking about our culture uh, and the messages uh, that we encounter through media and elsewhere, um, how often is it this idea that enough is enough, you don't need that much versus you need more, got to get this, got to get the new thing. And uh, I'm sure you already have some thoughts kind of going around your mind there. This is when we start to see Lenny's, uh, I guess you could say like uh, delusional mind, hallucinogenic mind, uh, where he starts to see his aunt Clara here, right? And she really serves to remind Lenny that George is always helping him out, right? And not only helping him out, but giving him more uh, because he needs it, right? And George is, is willing to be selfless in those moments, take less for himself and give more to uh, Lenny. And if there was ketchup, why, he'd give it all to you. Now, I don't know if this represents any sense of truth. Is this really the way it is? Is, is it really that George is mustering all he can and digging deep to give Lenny everything that he needs or, or based on what we have as evidence, this whole book, uh, is it different? Uh, is he taking advantage of him? All these questions are crucial because, you know, we've kind of come to the end of the book and we've also come to the end of their relationship, at least in the physical companion sense, right? Uh, this, is, this is almost it. I think a, a key piece of diction in this book is the word miserable, or often used as an adverb here, uh, miserably, like, you know, he said something miserably. Uh, and there's a lot to be said of the human experience in this idea of misery. You've heard of expressions like misery loves company, meaning when we have misery in our lives, we love to either talk about it with other people or somehow include them, maybe in positive, you know, or, or very negative ways. Um, but misery, right? And Lenny is in a state of misery here at the end, and I think it represents the human condition. I don't think Lenny's on his own in terms of uh, his feelings, uh, the themes that represent his life. I think he is just a, let's say, kind of an exaggerated example of the same kinds of uh, conflicts that all of us are faced with, right? Men and women uh, throughout the world, especially working men and women. Now, on Clara's and Lenny's mind one minute. Now, I want to mention this too. It's kind of crazy. Notice that it's not until chapter six where we finally get into Lenny's mind. Uh, Steinbeck had this whole book to, you know, intermittently show us what it was like to be in Men Lenny's mind with these, you know, hallucinogenic visions uh, of uh, Aunt Clara or now, which is even more crazy, uh, is this giant kind of ferocious rabbit uh, that, that pops out of his, uh, that just kind of pops into his mind. And it takes on the voice of George, just so we're clear. Oh, I'm sorry. And it takes on the voice of Lenny. And again, without reading the exact words here, what it serves to do is to create that anxiety in Lenny all over again. You ain't fit to do the rabbits. You ain't got a purpose in that. Uh, George ain't gonna want you or need you for that. And Lenny starts to get into this heated debate, uh, of course, kind of with himself. I would not forget, he says loudly, right? And the rabbit in his own voice keeps on telling him, uh, that George is going to be sickened by Lenny, not going to let him take care of the rabbits, which is all he can think of uh, in terms of a purpose, I believe. And not only that, to add a little bit more to that, he says, and he's going to beat hell out of you with a stick. That's what he's going to do. Now, to George's credit, we don't have any evidence in this book that George has ever really beat the hell. Actually, he said he's beat, beat him up a few times, right? And he doesn't lay a finger on me. And he says it so briefly that it really kind of cancels out any further exploration uh, of that abuse. But maybe hearing it here, maybe, uh, you can have your own kind of analysis. Uh, but I would say maybe it's happened a lot. 
uh, and it's happened so much that it's become this, you know, this 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 kind of major part of Lenny's dis like disrupted psychology, right? What what really uh, ails him? What bothers him? Uh, and when we start talking about beatings, see, I mean, we don't see George beat Lenny in this book, um, but it's obviously probably happened before. But it goes back to that other theme that Curly kind of set off for us: smite right and an expression of cruelty through physical blows and violence um it gets blurred sometimes we look at our culture nowadays with the popularity of mma fighting and there's a respect and a discipline to it but at the end of the day i think we also have to be critical and recognize that that smite that's two guys just beating the crap out of each other and at some point it's probably an expression of cruelty to some degree don't forget that it's smite that subjugates populations it's smite that um throws armies against each other and, and leads to incredible loss, right? So it is this brutality, this physical violence. And he's worried about that. Um, the rabbit keeps talking and he, he's starting to repeat some arguments that Lenny's already heard uh, in previous chapters, such as, he's just going to leave you. And then what are you going to do when you don't have George there by your side? And this was an argument, believe it or not, that Crooks made. And that's not a very nice thing for Crooks to say to Lenny, and we talked about that uh, in a, uh, uh, a previous lecture. Now notice what happens here. Uh, as soon as that rabbit disappears from Lenny's mind, we have George come out of uh, the brush. Right? So it almost like, if you've ever seen, and someday you will, the old Indiana Jones, where he takes like the skull or whatever kind of treasure he's grabbing off the pedestal, but then he's got to put like the bag of sand on it, right, to do the weight. It's what it feels like to me, where this rabbit that has such a s immense psychological presence in Lenny's mind is he immediately goes away as soon as something else that equally has this major psychological presence in Lenny's mind arrives, and that is George. So for me, at least personally, you have your own ideas, of course. They are one and the same repeating the same kind of rhetoric that we hear throughout the entire text. And it's all very contrary to the warmth and the depth of George's voice and words when he talks about the joint dream and bringing more people on as well. We talk about candy, we talk about crooks for a second. Um, the warmth and the depth that's involved there versus what we're getting here in Lenny's mind. We feel bad for Lenny at this point knowing what he's been dealing with. Lenny says, I know, you aren't, I, know, I know you're not the kind to leave me, and it's true, in a sense, George will not be leaving him here. He will be handling the situation. This is where it starts to get incredibly sad. Um, Lenny says, you know, they, they always go through this kind of uh, imaginary series uh, but it's not so imaginary, and that's why it's ironically sad here. But it's always like this narrative that they play out. And maybe that's what the, the dream or the American dream is for all of us, is a narrative that we play out in our minds. Whether we're living the dream and just kind of making it happen day by day, or if this is something that's kind of a far-off uh, aspiration, um, we have this narrative, narrative of the dream that plays over in our minds. And remember, for theirs, it starts with in some ways, the, the, the negative sides of this. For instance, here, George is saying, if I didn't have you, Lenny, if I didn't have to take care of you, well, I could do this and I could do this. And he said it so many times, sadly, to Lenny, that Lenny expects it. He can almost uh, recite it, right? Um, and here, George says, again, fittingly as always, and when the end, and when the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go to a, cat house and he stopped again and remember we have the evidence throughout this text that that's exactly what George has been doing and that's what he's been doing all along is he just gets into this this rut or or a cycle uh, a, a, a a rut of a cycle uh, in which he earns his money all month on a, on, a, on somebody else's farm making them richer and then he takes the little bit of, that they want to give him is 50 bucks and then instead of saving that toward a dream or putting it together with other people, which is this kind of nice collectivism, which is such a nice difference than just on my own, got to do it myself and struggle in that way. Um, instead of even thinking about saving for that, he goes and spends it on 
prostitutes and alcohol and pool. I mean, this guy's even just sitting in pool rooms all night and drinking. And when you don't have that much cash, that doesn't sound like the most responsible thing to do. And here he says it like it's a projection, a possibility. But now, in truth, we know that he's been doing this all along, even with Lenny. Uh, so it has, it has nothing to do with Lenny uh, in that way. It's easy, he would be doing this regardless, and he's been doing it all along. And maybe that's why this whole dream with Lenny never really worked out. And we, I, I feel so, so devastated for Lenny at the end here. But at the same time, he's done things that you, are, you just can't erase, and maybe there is no uh, solution to it outside of what George chooses to do here. That motif is here again, the shouts of the men. It started with the horseshoe tournament, which I think represents competition and this boisterousness and perhaps this uh, 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 competi uh, competitiveness, aggressiveness, uh, the jeering that takes place. But now all these voices, it's like it's just kind of followed now. And this is what's leading, uh, creating the pressure to end Lenny's life for George. Because we do know if they get here, the smite will be severe. Uh, Curly plans to shoot him with a shotgun in the guts, and the whole idea of that is that it's going to be incredibly painful uh, and take Lenny a long time to die, almost in a torturing way. Very different than what we know happens here, right? When George puts the bullet, just like the dog, we talked about of mice and men, of dogs and men, of whatever it's going to be, doing it the same way you would do to a dog to make sure there's no pain here. He's learned, oddly enough. Now, I think one of the interesting yet kind of disturbing questions here at the end is, does Lenny know what's about to happen? Uh, there's a paragraph that begins, quote, Lenny removed his hat dutifully and laid it on the ground in front of him. And this is asked after George asked him to just take off his hat. And, I, you know, you have to ask yourself what you think Lenny's capable of uh, at the end here. But I think he, he, there's a scene that just... I'll point it out in a minute. There's a scene coming up that I think is it's a nice connection. But why would he be so uh, submissive here? Right? It doesn't feel like that's in Lenny's character to be this submissive, to just take off his hat and put it down next to him with George behind him. It's awkward even for uh, this relationship that they have. So maybe he knows what's about to happen. He has some sense. And he's accepted what he's done. He's accepted all that he's done. We talked about the subtle redemption, which I think is a major part of the last couple chapters here. He recognizes everything that he's done here and maybe he's willing to die for it. It could be. It could be, right? George tells him, to, this is where it gets sad for me. I remember reading this all the time, right? Look across the river as I tell you about the dream one last time, like you can almost see it. Just trying to keep his eyes forward and not looking back here, which even in itself might be thematic. We all just want to look forward. Nobody really wants to kind of uh, uh, go back into the past here and think about what we've done. Uh, when it comes to redemption, that's especially true. Nobody wants to think about what they've done. They want to move forward with forgiveness, with understanding, with a new set of expectations perhaps on them. He looks where the spine and skull are joined, right? Going to do it painless. Is this euthanasia? Is this execution? Is this justice? It's a big question mark right now. I'll let you be in charge of that. For the rabbits, word for word, they agree. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of thematic understanding there, but everyone has to articulate that a bit on their own. Lenny's giggling with happiness as he, in his mind, is returning to this dream. This is important. Think about what was just in his mind uh, uh, several minutes ago when it came to Aunt Clara, um, the, um, you know, the, uh, the harsh words, the a complete lack of appreciation uh, that's expressed toward him, right? And then think about what's going through his mind right now. The fat of the land, the land producing my little part in this, producing the rabbits, this kind of small community that I have a purpose in. Um, it makes him happy. And I guess there definitely could be some sympathy that we have here. Here's where I think it all, like there's like, there is a pinpoint here where the biggest theme of all for me is, is given to us. And it's interesting because George 
this whole time he's been talking right to Lenny and it's about their context and their predicament. But here he broadens it to an immense scale, a worldly scale, a global scale. <clears throat> uh, he says, you and me, everybody's going to be nice to you. Ain't going to be no more trouble. Nobody going to get hurt. Nobody, uh, nobody going to hurt nobody nor steal from them. So he kind of launches away from just the small context of Lenny and he talks about really all men throughout the world, all women. People are just going to be nice to each other. They're not going to feel the need, the need to steal from each other. They're not going to feel the need to uh, hurt them, right? Whether that be physically, emotionally, or psychologically. And there's so much of that type of hurt in the world. Now, this is perhaps an ironic statement uh, given from George because maybe he's been stealing from Lenny all this time, uh, taking his money and using it for his own purposes, which haven't really really done anything to help Lenny in any kind of way. Lenny's always going to have to be attached to this authoritarian, you know, the proprietorship of property, right, in that kind of society where he has nothing. He has no foundation whatsoever. The only way they could have gotten away from that is to actually have their own little place where Lenny kind of could have existed in his own kind of domain, uh, safe and secure away from society. But that in itself is maybe a tall order to ask. There was that gray area, right? Who should have been working harder at this, Lenny or George? Or were both of them so far gone that this was an impossibility? And here we are full, uh, full circle with a very different situation on our hands. This is sad. Oh, let, me, let me dwell upon that theme one last time. You know, you got to think people um, at, you know, high school, college age, we, we like to think that whatever job we have, whatever purpose we end up having, is going to be of benefit to others. It's going to be a positive uh, a benefit to our societies. But that's not always the case. Um, we know that there's businesses that take advantage of people. We know that uh, there are, uh, you know, thuggish organizations out there uh, uh, that, you know, uh, hold on to control in many different ways. We know that there's corrupt politicians. We, we know all of these things. And so it really does come down to just who are the nice people and who are the not nice people? Where, who, are the, who are the horrible people that just take advantage of vulnerable people almost on a daily basis? And who are the people who are willing to not do that or even more so stand up and fight for those people and be the voice to help protect the vulnerable? Remember all the vulnerable people that we have in this book, poor white people, vulnerable. Uh, we have uh, African American uh, man, right? Vulnerable popula uh, population, right? We have women, uh, an incredibly vulnerable population, especially when you start going back hundreds and hundreds of years uh, into the early modern European age, and that's just in the European context. Talk about other uh, places throughout the world. We are talking about uh, old people, elderly, right? These are all very vulnerable portions uh, of our uh, of our populations right vulnerable uh, parts of it and how do we treat them are we there to protect them or are they on their own are we there to assist them or do we take advantage of them and i'll let you start to kind of think about your observations there um this is where it gets a bit sad lenny wants this land so bad and he even begs for it and i think when you, if you are of the mind set that he understands what's happening to him, he knows he's about to be shot in the back of the head, how could he not in some ways, um, then it's sad that he's begging. He's begging for his life and he's, the, the, the way that life would have to be led is on this land just tending to those rabbits, right? That's it. And he's begging for that. And George doesn't give it to him. He has a hard time with it. But finally, he shoots him. And it's a very quick ending here, people. From the moment that shot goes off, it's crazy how you're looking at everything happened kind of on the same page uh, in terms of the closure. Slim runs up. You got three characters at the end here. Slim, who seems to be that kind of authority, perhaps, of, of, of morals and ethics, especially as to how it plays out in the objective field of life. Remember, it's Slim who 
drowns those puppies early on and the theme comes full circle here why do you drown those puppies which are so cute and they have this potential for life because you don't want the mother to be overburdened why do you shoot lenny in the back of the head because you don't want george to be overburdened so there's that way of understanding the end here um, but i don't know i find it more interesting to be very critical of george because he he never seemed to do this right uh he could never really seem to cooperatively uh, try to make this happen, right? And, and Lenny was doing his part. He was working, but he was also getting into trouble, making it much hard, a much, a much, almost an impossible situation from George to try to do this on his own. I think, not, you know, it's, it's hard when you don't have a lot to go on at the end. Uh, it's, it's hard to kind of know what to make of it, but I think for me one thing that stands out is you got George and Slim and in the short amount of time that they've known each other a lot has happened and they've also come to have some impressionable conversations with each other uh, sharing very honest things about their lives uh, remember the confession that George has uh, where he talks about how he treats Lenny right and how awful he is to him and how it doesn't seem to make a difference etc so he's confessed some real stuff uh, to him so they're on like the, the it, it, and here he comes up and he says, you had to shoot him, right? Just trust me, you had to shoot him. You did the right thing. So they seem to be on the same page. They seem to be thinking about the tasks at hand, uh, the challenge before them on the same terms, right? Which is, you did the right thing. We're not going to sit here and hoot and holler and act like we need to shoot Lenny in the guts and make him, you know, have this agonizing kind of torment. But we do have to end this and, and kind of provide some closure. Maybe it's not even about justice. You did this to his wife and now it's got to happen here. Notice that Slim and George, they're more concerned with just the horrible treatment that's going to come down upon Lenny. Last lecture I was talking about, something small happens to Lenny and then he comes down like a tidal wave with his own kind of sense of you know, violence and retribution, whatever it's going to be. Notice that the same thing is happening to him at the end, in a way. He's killed Curly's wife. That's a heinous act. But now the force that's about to engulf him in the form of these men is, is a very threatening force. You might think you're the predator one day. You're up against a bigger one the next day, and now you're the prey. And I think that's, one of the, uh, that, that's what complicates that theme of predator versus prey uh, more so in this book. And the other half of that is going to be Curly and Carlson. Carlson, uh, Carl, Carl stands for man, like man in the man, like the very general man sense, like man, right? So, and he's here with Curly. And Curly's known for his kind of brute force and his cockiness and all these things. So it makes sense that these two men would be coupled together at the end too, providing us, I think, with a pretty fine contrast to uh, George and Slim. Uh, and we could go into a lot of detail, especially if we we're in a class right now discussing um, what that contrast would be between these two men. The contrast hangs on the statement they make at the end, or the question they ask. Now, what the hell you suppose is eating them two guys? It's kind of a weird comment in the end. I, I wouldn't even imagine them making that comment with a dead Lenny executed, you know, in the back, you know. I wouldn't think that this would be the comment, but that's okay. This is what we're given. But what the hell do you think is eating those two guys? Meaning something's on their conscience. What's happened here is affecting them in a way that we don't understand or that it just, we don't have the same reaction. We're not having the same response. Maybe they're more callous. Maybe they see Lenny in a more one dimensional way. We as readers, I would hope by the end of this book, have a way more two, three, four, f you know, five dimensional way, a very complex way of understanding Lenny, especially when you think about what he represents on a broader thematic level, which I always think is important to do. So uh, just very different re uh, reactions here at the very end. Lastly, just remember that contrast. What would have happened if uh, the men would have found Lenny before George? It would have been a massacre. It would have been torture. Um, it would have been smite uh, to uh, kind of a fulfilling degree. But instead, George gets there, uh, steals the Luger from Carl, right? So we under remember, George is 
One thing we can say about George is uh, he's not really handy with a gun. He doesn't feel comfortable around a gun. I think as soon as he uses the gun for the one purpose he needs it for, he, he throws it away. And that's a nice thing. And if you look at George as a common representation of man or farmer or kind of this, you know, uh, this general man, maybe violence is not in our nature, right? Uh, but then again, you have George matching up with Carl, Carl, man, uh, who has the gun in the first place. So you have these competing visions, these competing notions of what a man is, to have the gun or to not have the gun, to feel comfortable with the gun and confident with the gun or to feel like very insecure with the gun. Right? And it speaks to two very different individuals, uh, you know. Um, so, um, but remember, if they would have found him, it would have been a very painful experience for uh, Lenny, whereas George finds him and he does what he planned on doing, why, which is why he wanted to get him get there first all along. I hope you enjoyed this book. Uh, I know it was very nice going back into it uh, after 10 years. It's amazing how how fast the, the time flies. I think this really is one of my favorite books. Top three, top five. Um, just because it's hard to analyze in, in many respects, but at the same time, I think the themes here are very uh, important uh, to who we are as people. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a beautiful day.